shit. Like, fuck her. I know. I, I'm more of a say stuff to people's face, so I never get worried because I'm like, oh, I'll just say it to their face. But like, yeah, that would have been bad if we're like, by I the think way. we're live. <laughs> Wait, are we live? Yes. Oh, we're live. Oh my God. Okay. Welcome, Houston. Hi. I wish I could comment back to people. I don't know. I you never know can. how. Do you see where it says uh, join the chat? And then it says connect to YouTube. Who has YouTube? Yeah, it, it doesn't really let you. I'm well, you know try. what you can do is you can sign in. Um, you can just go to YouTube at, or face, you can go on your Facebook. You just have to mute your Facebook and then you, um, can go ahead and answer people. So, I hey everyone, people, how is everyone doing? So, hi, we did not know we were live. So that little beginning, you got a little behind the scenes. Um, so yeah. So, hey everyone, uh, first of all, biggest announcement. It is OCD awareness week. I hope everyone's Ooh. having a great time. Uh, it started Sunday the 8th and it goes until this Saturday the 14th. I was saying last night on the live, I was like, if it's OCD awareness week, I feel like I get the right to be obnoxious, like cut lines up. Panera bread. Like if I get pulled over <laughs> for a speeding ticket, I'm like, it's OCD awareness week. You can't, you can't ticket me. Like I shouldn't have to pay my cell phone bill this week. So this is um, my one week. <laughs> it is our week. It is our week. Well, welcome everyone. Happy OCD awareness week. And if you're not familiar with OCD awareness week, OCD awareness week is an opportunity for us to spread information on what OCD is to the general public. As you know, our community always seems to be under attack. Uh, Allegra did a really good post lately about Khloe Kardashian, but we see it all the time in names of companies and names of brands and people using it like a, a funny little quirky um, uh, personality trait and the four of us have OCD and we can tell you that our story was not as uh, funny and comical as people seem to make it on social media. So OCD Awareness Week is to share what it is. It's also to create a community and to connect with people and resources. So that's what we're doing today. Super excited today's live. Before I jump in with my guests, we're going to be talking about trauma and OCD. We're also going to be addressing things like grief and shame. Um, and these are very important emotions that people with OCD experience. Also, how trauma, PTSD, OC intersects and how that comorbidity can influence your treatment. So we're going to be covering that for the next hour. We're super excited. We know you have a lot to do today. So to join us, we're honored. So before I jump in with all of our guests, just a quick uh, few announcements. So always remember, especially when it comes to trauma, this live stream is educational and not intended to replace therapy. For treatment related questions, please work with your provider or contact a local clinician. You can use the IOCDF's online resource directory at iocdf.org slash find dash help to locate a trained clinician near you. The International OCD Foundation is not a crisis hotline. If you're in a crisis or you are ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room or call 911 or the 988 suicide and crisis hotline uh, by dialing 988 or going to 988lifeline.org. And finally, we want to create a safe and be kind as respectful to everyone. So at the end of the day, we're here to support one another. This is being recorded and broadcast on several social media platforms and is being recorded. Oh, it's always a mouthful. All right, so <laughs> I'm gonna do my, my little pitch um, intro and then let you all introduce yourselves much better than I'm going to. But I'm going to the ordinance C. So to my left, which will be on the top right of the screen, is a really good friend of mine, an amazing colleague, and um, is still uh, Allegra social media OCD talk in my phone because we did a talk <laughs> no, about no. social media. And once <laughs> somebody gets their name in my phone, whatever I put it in, I keep it for life because yes. it's so funny to me. But Allegra is an amazing clinician licensed in California and New York. Uh, she is the founder and director of the Center for OCD, Anxiety, and Eating Disorders, um, and she does a lot of work on the topic we're talking about. So, Allegra, introduce yourself. I think that was I think that was beautiful. <laughs> oh so, yeah, my name is Allegra. I have lived experience with both OCD and PTSD, and my lived experience is really what fueled my passion for OCD education and advocacy. I'm so happy to be here with some of my really good friends talking about OCD and trauma. I am also traumatized, so I'm excited to be here and just grateful. Well, thanks, Allegra. Uh, my bottom left is Alexandra Reynolds, someone who helps lead the LGBTQ special interest group with me. She's also very active in helping to promote OCD and information all OCD Awareness Week and year long on her social media platform. Alexandra is obsessed. She also does a lot of stuff with NoCD. 
Um, I also saw your posts, uh, Alex, the stuff that you and Krista are doing on um, postpartum and perinatal OCD. So she has her hands in a lot of different things. Uh, Alexandra, welcome. It's good to see you. Thank you, Chris. You for conveniently left out that we are also friends, but I'll forget yes. for that. <laughs> yes, okay. a good friend. One of my, we had so much fun at Ethan and Katie's wedding together. Absolutely had a great time. She also wrote me a sweet card that I haven't opened yet because I just unpacked finally. So I have to read that, but um, Alex is a great human being. We're excited to have uh, oh, on this I love live you, Chris. So yes, I think Chris, you did beautiful. My name is Alex. I am Latina. I have lived experience with OCD, complex PTSD, and a severe dissociative disorder. So if I dissociate, we'll just handle that as it comes up. Um, I am also a graduate student hoping to one day become um, peers with these wonderful clinicians here in treating OCD and trauma. So I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Alex. And then finally, on my screen is Bronwyn Schroyer, who is a new per like a newer person in my life. So I don't have as much of a backstory as the other two. But uh, <laughs> Bronwyn and I are speaking on OCD, uh, specifically around discuss based OCD at next weekend's online OCD conference. Make sure you sign up at online OCD, uh, IOCF.org online OCD con. Um, but we did a talk together, which I'm really, really excited for people to see. Um, and I know Bronwyn um, has experience treating both. Oh, Allegra said bye <laughs> momentarily. Uh, I know Bronwyn has experience treating both trauma and OCD. Um, I know you've done a couple of um, uh, seminars on them that people were really looking forward to. And I even saw on OCD, I think Minnesota, you're doing a talk uh, coming up on it as well. So I know this topic is something that's near and dear to your heart. Uh, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Introduce Thank yourself. You. So I'm Bronwyn Schroyer. I am a LCSW. And yeah, this is my entire practice. I only treat OCD and PTSD. I have lived experience of both as well. And I'm really excited to be here with you all. And yeah. hopefully Allegra will come back. Yes, hopefully Allegra comes back. Um, I'm sorry. I've been trying to comment back to y'all and it's not working. So I'm just going to stop. Alex, <laughs> right, it, it wouldn't let me, it's not letting me do it and it keeps exiting me out. So sorry. No, it's all good. Um, I think a good place to start is a lot of times people will hear different terms. So I'll let anybody take this over that they would like to take it. But just to kind of start with the baseline, um, what is, you know, the difference between trauma, um, PTSD, complex trauma, complex PTSD, like, does anyone want to start there? Because a lot of times what I'll see is like, when people post those different terms, people will ask, like, what's the difference between trauma and PTSD or the complex component of it? So whoever would like to jump in, if you could just start there, I think it'll give our, our viewers a better understanding. I can start with PTSD versus trauma. And then I'll, I'll let Alex do the CPTSD since she has lived experience, because I think that'll be good. But PTSD is a medical diagnosis, like DSM-5 diagnostic criteria. So there's very specific criteria we look at when we're looking at PTSD. And that's important, especially for research, so that we have um, criteria that goes across research studies. So we're looking at the same things. But people who are clinicians within the trauma world know that maybe that PTSD diagnosis isn't including everybody in the world that actually has a trauma history. So they've gone through a traumatic event. And so a traumatic event is going to be something that's going to impact your functioning. Um, it's going to be something that you walk away with um, a certain level of different types of um, symptoms. So some types of like hypervigilance, it can affect your sleep. Um, it can make it so that you have negative cognitions about yourself or the world. And those are all PTSD diagnostic, diagnostic criteria, but it may not fit um, one particular part of the PTSD um, diagnostic criteria, which is criteria A, which says that we have to be witnessing or experiencing a life-threatening event, something that's sexual in nature, or it has to be a part of our job. So think of first responders. So that's the difference between PTSD, it's an actual diagnosis, trauma is going to be a traumatic event, something that happened to you and how you um, interpreted that into your world. And it's making you feel unsafe, or in, in some way and affecting your functioning in the world. And then I'll let Alex handle the CPTSD versus PTSD. Oh my gosh, I'm on the spot. Okay, y'all, correct, <laughs> correct me if I misspeak here because I'm not the professional yet. But um, as it was explained to me, complex trauma is not a real, a true diagnosis. 
However, it is used as a diagnosis or as a way to explain a particular set of symptoms that arise from a particular type of trauma, which is chronic long-term abuse, often when a person or group of people are in fear of their lives for a long period of time, such as prisoners of war or people who endure long-lasting chronic childhood abuse where they can't escape, or sometimes in instances of domestic violence where the person cannot escape for a long time. So in addition to a lot of the PTSD symptoms, such as flashbacks, there are a lot of behavioral symptoms. And I think there's more dissociation, more um, chaotic relationships. So more, I think, what people would call attachment issues, even though I wouldn't label it as that. You did awesome. Thanks. Yeah. I think well, something else to add too is that like it can often be multiple traumas. So with PTSD, we often see like that one major trauma, but with CPTSD, it can be multiple traumas over a period of time. It can be like developmental, attachment trauma, sexual trauma, et cetera. And Allegra, if you could speak to, I know, you know, I feel like you've led the charge in this and we were able to do some talks on it a couple, a uh, couple years ago, but you know, this idea of like people experiencing trauma from having OCD, you know, we've yes. talked about, I, I always think back to, there was a show on VH1 called obsessed and there was a woman that would shower for hours, but she would actually like stick things up certain parts of her body to clean it out. Cause she felt like it was contaminated. Um, and it caused some permanent medical history. I remember they talked about that, some per permanent medical damage. Um, so can you go into that a little bit? Yeah. I know that some clinicians disagree with this and I've heard before, like it's OCD can't be a trauma. It's, it's, it can be really uncomfortable. It can be painful, but it's not traumatic. And I have like what would be considered big T trauma, even though I hate using that word because I think all trauma is trauma. And to me, OCD has been the most traumatic thing that I've ever experienced. And it's not just like, it's a living with a disorder. Like if you are living with constant thoughts, like sexual thoughts about children and you're seeing those images play in your mind all day long and you might not be like experiencing it as someone who let's say has PTSD, but you're bearing witness to that all day long. And that can be traumatic. Compulsions can be traumatic. People who, you know, compulsively have sex and have really painful experiences from that people who physically harm themselves compulsively. Like I know Ethan talks a lot about like in his story, he talks about banging his head against the wall because he wanted to go to the doctor or the hospital so bad to get another reassurance check. And like those things can be traumatic. Having your life upended, which mine was in a split second was super traumatic losing your identity. I mean, there are so many pieces of OCD that I think can be really traumatizing. And I know that it doesn't like fit the PTSD diagnosis, but a lot of my clients and even myself have PTSD like symptoms in response to OCD. Like OCD is the trauma. We can't technically diagnose that, which I think is BS, but that's just my personal and clinical opinion. Well, I think about it. I mean, you just made a good point too. I mean, I think about it like some clients with body dysmorphic disorder, some people will take the, the typical extreme of like not leaving their house, not dating, not sleep, like not having any kind of sexual contact with people because they don't like the way they look. But I also have clients that do the extreme opposite where they're constantly putting themselves in sexual situations that they'd never put themselves in to get reassurance that they're attractive enough, that they look normal, that they look okay. And then as they're getting treatment, they look back and they're like, this isn't me. I feel felt like I was a completely different person, putting me in very risky sexual situations that I never would have put myself in. And now that I'm getting clarity through the treatment and recognizing where my identity's at, like I'm horrified at the person I was. And that suddenly becomes the treatment. They may have moved on from the BDD symptoms, but now they're struggling with the acceptance around putting themselves in those risky situations they never would have put themselves in originally. And so I think if we don't address those kind of things, we're, you know, we were all kind of trained in, in the, the CBT model of like these amount of sessions and then the symptoms are down and get them out. But these are the things that we're talking about today that if you're not addressing with your clients or if you have OCD yourself and you're not getting treatment for, these are the kind of things that last a long time and really cause some, some mental health and, and I would argue like spiritual damage. 
Yeah. And I think like one other thing, and then I want to pass it to Alex and Bronwyn, but another thing that comes to mind is how much people fear the onset of OCD again. And for me, it's not like, yes, there are some times when my OCD is loud where I do dip into the content, but a lot of the time it's that I'm so afraid that my brain is going to do to me what it did when I was 19. And like, that is trauma. Right? like I'm living my life so fearful of this traumatic thing happening again. And that happens for so many people. So many of my clients, even when they don't buy into their OCD anymore, are so afraid that the OCD is going to come back. And to me, that is trauma. Well, we also had somebody on the live last night who commented and we didn't get a chance because the comment came in late, but I'm like, this would be a good topic to talk about in a part two, because we did a part one on this uh, live stream with you, Allegra. But um, they were just saying, like, I thought I was going to be happy. Like they literally that was their comment yesterday. Like I finished treatment. I thought I was going to be happy. But now I feel like I'm behind. I feel like there's things in my life that I can't get back. I feel like I've missed out on things. And now I don't even have any motivation to go on with OCD being gone. And I always resonate with that. I thought it was going to be sunshine, unicorn and rainbows when my treatment ended. But I was like, oh, my God, I'm like 25. I live at home. I don't have friends. I don't date. I don't have anything to do. And at least I was busy with the OCD. <laughs> what the hell am I going to do all day? I was yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I was like semi pro at, at ruminating, but now I have nothing to do. And I remember that like two, three years after treatment, I felt like I was just waiting in a pool. Um, and I think that those things, you know, need to, to be addressed. Um, I'll jump into to Alex and then Bronwyn, like Alex for you. Um, can you talk a little bit about just like the intersectionality of having like trauma or PTSD rather complex PTSD and OCD and like how those two things manage? I, I always think like OCD is a burden enough. And then when people have comorbidities, it's like, Oh my God, <laughs> like we can't handle all those things at once. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. So I'm still kind of processing and, you know, formulating my own thoughts about, exactly what I feel like the intersection of trauma and OCD looks like. And I think that's an ongoing process for me as I sort of go through my trauma therapy myself and sort out everything as I am very much still in active trauma therapy. And I probably will be for a long time. But for me, I think the biggest thing was that having complex trauma really, I'm getting all emotional already, y'all. I'm sorry. I can't help it. But for me, having the complex trauma really stalled my progress in ERP. I couldn't do exposure work because every time I did exposure work, I was flooded and I dissociated. And we didn't even know it really at the time, but I was doing all these exposures and I was just kind of white knuckling my way through it. So I never got the benefit. In fact, I got to a point where I finished a hierarchy at the very beginning of my treatment and I forgot all of my skills. I didn't know that I had them anymore and I wasn't utilizing them. And I was like, why am I not better? And it's because I had dissociated throughout treatment and I didn't remember anything. It wasn't until I went and looked back at old homework that I realized, oh, I really have done this before. And so for me, I had to go get treated for trauma alongside my ERP with two different therapists, a trauma specialist, and then my OCD specialist in order to get to a point where I was emotionally regulated enough and grounded enough to do my exposures. And since avoidance is such a big piece of both trauma and, you know, OCD, we like to avoid everything. I had to break the association between my avoidance in OCD and my avoidance in trauma and sort of compartmentalize them so that I could get through exposure work. Yeah, no, and thanks for opening up about that. I, I was going to ask you this question, Bronwyn, but Wynn kind of already asked it. Um, so I'll bring in Wynn, um, throw you the question. I'm going to expand on it. So Brennan, if we could throw up at... Um, 321 year time from when. Um, can you talk a little bit? I mean, Alex just talked about a lived experience of like trying to do OCD treatment while having trauma. I know for me in my own treatment, I did the OCD treatment first, then the trauma after. That's kind of what Wynn's asking. Is there kind of like a formulaic way to handle both of that? Is it different for everybody? What can that look like when people are experiencing both PTSD and OCD? Yeah, 
Yeah, and this is why it's so important for us to be having these kinds of conversations because we need way more OCD specialists who are also trauma specialists. We need a lot more trauma specialists who also know something about OCD because we know that these this particular co-occurring presentation can be difficult to treat when you don't know what you're doing with both of those um both of those conditions. So is there a magic path? No, it's going to be dependent on the person. But thankfully, we have researchers out there that are attempting to figure out, you know, what is an ideal path forward with clients who have co-occurring PTSD and OCD. Um, Dr. Caitlin Pensiati's work for one is a really good um, set of research to look through as she's trying to piece that together. But I know in my own journey, I had ERP first. Um, and then years later, I did trauma treatment. And then I had to come back to my OCD treatment after that and use inference based CBT. So it did I need both at the same time I did. And what I do with my clients now is I pendulate between treatments, always client led listening to my clients and what they need. in that moment with clinical guidance from me on what I'm seeing. But we start usually people are coming to see me for OCD first. And we start in with that. And then I'll hear the trauma stories coming up. And then we'll shift into some PTSD work and then shift back um, to OCD again. But it just depends on the client and what's um, what's coming up for them in that moment. But we do know that when we start to treat one, the other one can shoot up. So it's important that you see a therapist that knows how to handle both when you have PTSD and um, OCD, or if you don't even meet PTSD criteria because of that silly criteria A, if you have a trauma history and OCD. Yeah, I, I want to throw up Cash's question at 321. Let's say, uh, I'll throw this to you, Allegra. Let's say, Bronwyn, somebody doesn't have, or, or, or Allegra, somebody doesn't have training in both OCD and PTSD or trauma work. Is it what Cash is asking at, at 321? Like, is it okay to have more than one therapist, maybe a therapist directly for trauma and a therapist directly for OCD? I love this question because I've almost always had two therapists at the same time. Like I started seeing a like psychodynamic talk therapist originally, and then obviously she told me she wasn't OCD specific. So I got OCD treatment probably like two years later and saw them both at the same time. And it was so helpful because they both did different things. They were both on the same page about what it is that they were doing. And my OCD therapist couldn't do what my psychodynamic therapist could, and my psychodynamic therapist could not do what my OCD therapist did. So I think as long as both clinicians are on the same page, it can be super powerful. And I do that often with my clients. Like if someone has PTSD, but they're coming to me for an eating disorder, then they see a PTSD therapist, I treat for the eating disorder, and then we like collaborate together. So it's absolutely okay. I know, again, I feel like I'm like the controversial person. I know some clinicians say it's not. But to me, it feels almost unethical for that to be not the case because we wouldn't say, like, go to a heart doctor and get everything fixed if your foot is hurting. We would say go to a heart doctor and then also get your foot fixed. Like, both things can happen simultaneously. Yeah, so I'm and the key over. is just collaboration, right? Yes. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Like, so both therapists, because where it gets bad is if you're seeing the same two different therapists for the same thing. That's a no-no. But if you're seeing two different therapists for two different things and they you sign an ROI and they collaborate, that's awesome. I'm like such a big support supporter of that. Yeah. And Alex, for you, like what did yours look like? Like for you personally, like what did it look like? Like were you able to see the same therapist for both? Did you see different therapists? And like how did you manage that? Because sometimes it can be overwhelming working with a therapist on one uh, diagnosis versus like then having to either see a different therapist or even sometimes the same therapist for two. Yeah, that's a great question. It's so funny. I was just telling Allegra about this earlier. So I started out seeing my OCD specialist only, and I didn't really think I had trauma, which is really funny. <laughs> and then he started encountering a lot of roadblocks in my treatment and I guess noticing things. So he said that we needed to look at treating the trauma. And I he he tried to do the ethical thing and refer me to a trauma specialist within his practice. And I said, no, I don't want to. I want to see you. So he said, I will try for you because you are not comfortable seeing someone else. And we tried prolonged exposure, which I know is a very evidence-based type of therapy for trauma. And I disassociated completely. 
I just dissociated. I said it wrong, but um, completely. And I lost half of that session and then a complete other session. I have no idea what happened. So after that, he sent me to a trauma specialist in his practice and I signed a release and they worked together to help treat the OCD with ERP. And I continued my exposure work while also being mindful of what was going on in my trauma work. And so if I was triggered in one area, the other would pull back a little bit. And we kind of navigated that way for, I'd say about a year until I was ready to leave ERP work on my own. And they were also very mindful of my leaving ERP. It was very consensual. It was very much my decision. I was titrated down at a very gradual rate because of the abandonment issues that can come up. And um, I was very, very attached to my old therapist. So it was really hard for me to leave. So I, I feel like I got the, the best possible treatment there. Yeah, for my own care, it, I did it kind of, my OCD was so loud and then my body dysmorphic disorder was so loud. So I actually saw two different therapists, one for OCD, one for BDD. But for me, it was like the trauma that I had gone through when I was at my worst and I was I was housebound and then hospitalized, I needed to move in with family and my trauma, came, you know, my PTSD came from my family. And so my OCD symptoms flared up not understanding that there was a correlation. But for me, the the OCD was so loud and dominant that I did that first. But then it was like, I think part of the reason after treatment, I wasn't so like, yay, everything's great, is it was like all these things that have been sort of like stuffed down because the OCD and the BDD was so loud, all came to the surface. And then I'm like, holy crap. And I remember thinking like, do I go back to my OCD therapist, but this isn't really OCD. So I found someone, um, my, my uh, PTSD, and then I'm gonna throw it to you, Bronwyn to talk about the um, the different ther therapies specifically for trauma, but the therapy that I worked on for trauma was cognitive behavioral therapy. I didn't really do exposure therapy. Um, I didn't do EMDR, but for me, it was the cognitive based therapy. And I think for me, that was what was best. I think I really had to just like talk it out and figure it out and understand my patterns, the different beliefs that came from all the stuff I went through childhood. There's a lot of like self blame and self hatred and things like that. Um, but that was the way that it worked for me is doing like one and then the other. But I'm glad to hear from all of us on this panel because I think people are going to watch thinking there's like a specific magic like steps. It sounds like whatever's best for people. Bronwyn, if you could jump in and talk a little bit about like what are those specific therapies that people could use for um, for uh, trauma and PTSD? Yeah, I mean, luckily, we've got really great trauma modalities out there. Um We've mentioned prolonged exposure already, and that's a, that is a very effective one for trauma. There's cognitive processing therapy, which um, is very different than prolonged exposure. There is a kind of almost like a version that's kind of like cognitive processing therapy that's cut its in, it's like half the amount of time though, and it's called written exposure therapy, and it's showing in um, studies to be just as effective, just as effective as CPT, which is really exciting. And then we have things like EMD trauma-focused CBT. There's many, many um, modalities out there. There are um, so many actually that it's, it's great because whatever you need, somebody would probably be able to find for you. And people do need different things. Uh, my own treatment was with EMDR and inference-based CBT was my, in, my interaction, which was great because all of the negative cognitions that I held about my traumas was the exact same negative cognition I held about myself within my OCD, that I'm gonna somehow become this accidentally negligent person. And all my traumas, I was holding that exact same cognition that I had somehow caused these terrible things to happen to me or I was at fault. And so you could see the interplay between my, um, my traumas and my OCD and why treating just one wasn't going to like be able, they, they were so interconnected and my OCD was hijacking so many of my traumas as um, evidence that I needed to listen to my OCD. And so finding what works for you is going to be important, but any of those modalities are um, evidence-based and um, good ones to go ahead and look for. Just want to make sure you find somebody who's doing evidence-based work. Yeah. Allegra, I'm going to throw the next comment to you and also add to it. So it's from Katya at 323 Brennan about 
Um, she said, we did trauma therapy, but it was feeding the OCT, OCD too much. I know we also talked about earlier um, when we we're kind of prepping for this live about um, how to make OCD treatment more trauma informed. So one of the things I guess I'm throwing a two part is like sometimes when people do work with two therapists, especially if the therapist that's working with the trauma or PTSD doesn't know OCD, sometimes mm -hmm. they can be like, you know, inflaming the OCD more. So that's kind of the first question. How do we prevent from what Katya experienced? And then part two for you, Allegra, is how do we make OCD treatment more trauma informed so that somebody isn't getting re-traumatized or harmed in their treatment? So I think the first part of that question, and it's a really good question for sure, is the clinician who's not doing the OCD work definitely needs to understand OCD. And that can come from the OCD specialist sending resources or talking to the trauma specialist. That can come from the client sending a couple of resources. But I have found when I work with another clinician on the same client that like we really are working together and I understand my role in every which way in which I could trigger that thing. So a lot of education and understanding. And I think it also takes the right practitioner. Like you could do everything by the book and you could still just not be the right clinician for someone. And I think sadly what happens is you might have two clinicians working with one client and one of them just like isn't great. And there's a train wreck happening. So I would, <laughs> Chris, so I would yeah, say... Sure. <laughs> As long as like the person is informed, it should be okay. But there's also other factors that I think would make, like if someone, let's say, is doing the OCD work and it's flaring the trauma up or you're really digging into the trauma and that's flaring the OCD, like it's just, I can't give a black and white answer for this because I think it's so client dependent. Well said. Um, Alex, I want to throw you in for a comment that we got at 323 from Leanne about disassociation. Can you explain what that is? And then I know a lot of people like in the comment disassociate with OCD. I know there's disassociation with trauma. Um, kind of maybe explain like how you knew where it was from and what worked for you. <laughs> yeah, throwing me to the wolves. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, so dissociation can be on a spectrum. And it can go from very mild dissociation, which most folks experience some of that. And I always, I always think about when I'm driving in my car and I'm listening to music and I'm just really into the drive and then I look up and I'm home. That's something that most people experience from time to time. That's some very mild form of dissociation. And it can range from mild to more severe, like what a lot of people with OCD will experience, which is your body's response to extreme anxiety, disgust, fear, all of that stuff. And your brain is trying to protect you from it. And so you may feel slightly dissociated, like you're looking down at yourself or you're outside of yourself looking in on yourself or things feel very slow motion. And that can be a really scary feeling. And I always like to remind people when I talk about it, that's not dangerous. It's just scary feeling. And then there's the more severe end, which is what I experience, which is a full blackout. And so that would be more like a dissociative fugue or dissociative amnesia. And that's when people don't remember what they did or said. And I didn't know that I was experiencing that. I know when I'm experiencing mild dissociation or depersonalization because I can feel that I, I'm looking outside of myself or I'm, you know, looking up, you know, looking down from above. But if I have dissociated completely, then that would be, I don't know until I come to and I realize that I'm in the middle of a conversation and I have no idea what I just said. And Bronwyn, what's best for someone going through what Alex is going through? Like what treatments do we see or what tools do we see that really helps people when they're disassociating? Yeah, so those trauma treatments, everybody is going to, uh, trauma therapists are ready to deal with dissociation and helping people learn to ground, come back into themselves, um, greater understanding and self-compassion for why we are dissociating, that it's it's something there that's trying to help you, right? It's helping you cope. So it's not something to be ashamed um, about. And so having that self-compassion, learning that about yourself, um, but therapists are gonna help you learn how to reground back into reality. Absolutely. Allegra, at 12, uh, at 324, rather, Zachary Miller asked, like, I feel like the recognition of diagnosis is a hurdle to these treatments. 
What is the best way? Because I think obviously for us, like we had to live, breathe and sleep the DSM. And then being in the field, we start to see things like complex PTSD or orthorexia. Maybe they're not quite diagnosis yet, but people are using them enough that we recognize them. How can somebody watching the stream figure out like, do I have PTSD, trauma, OCD? Is it body dysmorphic disorder, generalized anxiety? Like how can they navigate a system and get a really good diagnosis to know what direction they can go in to get help? I think like the DSM provides a framework where we can, like it offers a framework, it looks at specific symptoms, but I don't think that the DSM is everything. And I tend to listen to lived experience a lot of the time. Yes, of course, I'm about evidence-based things, but when I see something playing out, like when I see my clients traumatized from OCD, then I will have them get treatment for that or treat it as such. So I think using the DSM, trusting that, but also trusting your own lived experiences and not, not seeking out treatment just because you don't think that you meet a PTSD diagnosis. I think that that can stop a lot of people. And at the end of the day, whatever your diagnosis is, like you can still be in therapy. A diagnosis at the end of the day is just a name for something that you're experiencing, whether you're on a very low end of a spectrum or you're like, absolutely struggling, you still deserve treatment. So, and then I would say finding clinicians, like I love Bronwyn, I mean, I love all of you, but like Bronwyn in the like trauma OCD work has been so validating for me. And I've learned so much about just like trauma and OCD and how they can interact and like kind of why I am the way that I am just like being her friend and finding clinicians who validate your experience, I think is really important because you sadly will see therapists who will say like, this cannot be traumatic. You are not traumatized. And that's really tough for me to hear people say. Well, I think to add to that, I mean, it's like a lot of people reach out to consult with me about BDD and they'll say to me, they'll like go over what their client's going through. And I always say like, unfortunately, like it does not meet the DSM criteria. And with that said, your client absolutely is struggling. They are very unhappy with their body image. They're very concerned about what people are thinking with. They don't like when they look in the mirror. And just because they don't find fit that criteria does not mean we don't get them care. The good thing is a lot of the interventions, specifically CBT that we see with BDD treatment can be absolutely effective with things kind of like body image or, you know, body dysmorphia, which is more of a, a, of a common colloquial term versus medical. And so I always say that to clients. I'm like, please, just because you look and you, you don't check a certain box, doesn't mean that you're not still struggling. And I think what, what also doesn't happen and put out there is like, even in the DSM, there's a lot of those codes that are basically like, Hey, this person doesn't fit this criteria, but they still fit this code diagnosis. So a lot of times people say, well, the biggest worry is like my insurance may never give me a super bill or cover trust that we can find codes that absolutely ethically fit what you're going through so that you can get that recovery. You know, you can get that help. Um, I'm going to throw this one to you, Bronwyn, at 326. It's from Stephanie. She says, when I was seeing an OCD therapist, he recommended seeing a trauma therapist, but they weren't on the same page. And I felt abandoned by the OCD therapist because they had talked behind my back and disagreed on treatment. OCD therapist told me I needed to decide who my therapist was going to be. How do we prevent this? I will say I don't always see this as much with therapists. I see it a lot with psychiatrists. So <laughs> not not the psychiatrist like Ryan Vadrine and that we, we love all you, love Ryan. We love it's Ryan. Nice. We love. Um, I'm so mad that her name is not coming to me right now. But <laughs> there's a, there's two other really like kick butt female uh, psychiatrists that I love that we've had on the live stream. And I know they wouldn't do that, but I see that a lot with that. But how do we prevent this from happening to clients? Well, first, Stephanie, I just want to say, I'm really sorry that happened to you. That is absolutely hurts my heart for you to have gone through that. It makes me a little teary. Um, you know, this is something that unfortunately does happen. And I think that it actually starts with us as a profession. We need to make sure that we're talking to our colleagues and helping them understand that this kind of thing is not okay. Um, but when therapists are having disagreements about treatment, um, you know, my take is you put ego aside, you check, you make sure that you know what's best practice for this client that's in front of you. And if you are the therapist that, um, you know, you've got a good relationship with your client, you're going to talk about that. Um, and you're going to always make sure you're listening to the client because the client is the person's, I mean, 
you guys are people. The four of us were people. We were human beings in front of other people asking them to help us, right? And that's what we always have to keep in mind. But I think this is just a continue um, education piece of us within our own therapist communities about how we have to make sure that we're talking and we are um, always putting our clients first, not our egos first or our modality first or whatever. It's always going to come back to that person. Well said. Um, I'm going to throw this one to you, Alex. It's from Layla at 328. The main barrier for starting ERP for me has been my religious trauma and those symptoms like hypervigilance, disassociation, chronic shame, preventing me from staying emotionally in any exposures. I know you're talking a little bit about that. So how did you personally navigate to be able to do OCD treatment despite having some experiences with, with trauma that may have made that difficult? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think one of the biggest catalysts in my sort of OCD treatment was learning about cognitive diffusion and starting to learn to really use non-engagement responses in response to rumination and identifying that what was going on was that my OCD was latching onto my traumatic experiences. And so when I was trying to process trauma, I was actually ruminating. And so learning, even though it hurt, to use non-engagement in response to my trauma intrusive thoughts helped a lot. And what I mean by that, it, I'm not saying don't process your trauma. I'm saying sometimes we can ruminate. And so I had to learn to set limits with it. And I, one of the ways I did that was by taking it to therapy and only processing trauma with my therapist at first and then doing the homework I was given. And I think that was something that both of my therapists worked out. The other big piece for me was self-compassion. Having a lot of self-compassion for myself, for what was going on, for what my brain had done in response to my trauma, compassion for why I was struggling in ERP, and not shaming myself when I went and compulsed, ritualized, or fell into depression because everything was triggered as I started to learn to utilize my skills very slowly, I took very small steps in ERP. I mean, so small, they were, they were literally baby steps. Like people would look at that and go, why are you doing your exposure so slowly? Because that's what I needed to keep me from flooding. And as I did those steps and I gained confidence, I was able to stay more grounded. I also did grounding alongside my ERP, which I know a lot of clinicians are gonna say, no, 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 what's that? But sometimes when I got flooded in session, we practiced grounding. We would pause and my clinician would say, okay, look at the stripes on my shirt or, you know, count the number of gray hairs I have or whatever it was. But it helped me to learn to keep myself grounded. You're going to be here all session, babe. <laughs> well, I was like, right now I have zero, like, but, but, but I never want a client to start counting if I ever do get any. I'm going to be well, like, no, no, no. <laughs> I think he's such a good sport. <laughs> he is such a good sport. But it helped, he, you know, both of my therapists really destigmatized what I was going through and made me feel like Bronwyn was saying, like a human being who just had a lot of really rough experiences and my brain reacted in certain ways to keep me safe. And I think out of everything, that was really the biggest piece was that unconditional acceptance, self-compassion, and then the room to practice my skills the way I needed to at the pace I needed to, not what a book said. Well, Can I, also, I add um, to this? Oh, wait. Yeah, yeah. No, you go first. I think like some, two things have come to mind that are really important. Number one is that like ERP doesn't work for everyone. Yes, of course, it works for like a good majority of people, but there are other evidence-based treatments for OCD. And if you are really traumatized and you find that doing exposure triggers that trauma, then like maybe try a different, I mean, this is not clinical advice, just like thoughts. There are different treatments, like inference-based cognitive behavioral therapy, other metacognitive therapies, ACT. Like there are other things that you can do because I could see how if you're really like flooded and traumatized, jumping into that ERP could be difficult. And I also think it's important, like, I think so often we say like the theme doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It's all OCD. It all functions the same. I disagree. I think that especially if someone has, let's say, religious scrupulosity and then they have a lot of religious trauma and they're queer and ex like all of these things are interplaying with one another. So I think just saying like do ERP, the theme doesn't matter, might not be of service to the client. So 
not only maybe trying out a different treatment if ERP isn't working, but also like looking at how can we, how is trauma fueling your OCD? Because that does happen for a lot of people. And I don't think it's as simple as like, just treat the OCD. I really don't. Like, I think that I had sexual obsessions for like, I'm not going to say for a reason, but I can see how my upbringing absolutely contributed to that. And I think that like, we don't hear enough about that. And no, Zachary, at 347, you are not deficient if an evidence-based modality doesn't help you. Like in my own treatment, mindfulness and cognitive work were the most helpful things. I remember doing my first exposure and I was like, this ain't going to work, babe. <laughs> I got to be honest. <laughs> like, Let's move it along. So you're not deficient. Different things work for different people. And like for Alex and Chris, exposure therapy was wonderful. We're all human. We're all unique. We all have unique histories. And I just like, I hope that everyone understands that we're not robots. No. And, and ERP can be, it's important for therapists who are using ERP with somebody who is traumatized. You are going to keep their traumas in mind as you are doing yeah. the ERP work in OCD. You don't want to trigger the trauma. It's going to, it, it won't work. As Alex was saying earlier, it's not going to work. You're going to dissociate. You're going to be re-traumatized. We don't want ERP to be re-traumatizing and it doesn't have to be. Um, if that's a modality that works well for your particular brain, it can be done in a way that's not going to re-trigger your trauma. And well, I just oh, want to, oh, sorry, Chris. Yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. I just want to add, like, I think it's really important to, you know, my definition of ERP is probably not everybody's definition of ERP because my ERP was blended. There's a little bit of metacognitive in there. There's, you know, um, ACT, which is where cognitive diffusion comes from. There's mindfulness and there's self-compassion built in there. And I think it's all really important. And I think that's part of treating the whole person. And to me, what sets apart a really amazing clinician from someone who is just going by the book is the fact that they're able to blend all of these modalities to meet the client's needs where they're at. And it's the same with trauma. I did CPT. I'm doing CPT. I'm doing IFS. And who knows, I may end up doing some other stuff too. You know, it just, you never know. DBT. I think it's really important to be able to access and use all these tools to help people. Well, that's what I was going to say. And I'm glad you brought that up, Alex. It's like, for me, the way that I shift, and I've talked a lot about this, actually, I'm doing a talk on that with, with Liz uh, McInvale and Michelle Massey. We did a talk for the conference. The way that I do ERP, I feel like is very different. And it's much more advanced, not advanced, it's um, advanced over the years. For me, I don't do exposures for the sole purpose of getting someone anxious. I really want to do something that I feel like the client finds value in. So for instance, like if I have a client that has both trauma and OCD. And they're saying like, Chris, part of my trauma, the reason it's gotten worse is because of the OCD. I've been isolating. I'm a home. I'm not connecting with family. I'm not connecting with friends. I've dropped out of soccer or volleyball or whatever sport they play because the OCD is so bad. And now it's made my trauma louder because I'm away from the things that were really helping me cope. I'm not going to say like, okay, what got you like, what, what prevents you from playing soccer? And they're like, oh, I'm really afraid of getting people sick and like getting them a disease. And then I don't want to be around people that I care about. I don't do ERP in the way of like, okay, well, we're going to go touch really dirty things and then go to a store and touch it and hope little kids get it and get them sick. Like I don't find exposures valuable like that. Instead, I'll say like, okay, do you have a group of a couple close friends that you, that miss you and want to play soccer with you? And they're like, yeah, what if we learn to look at all those different safety behaviors that the OCs kind of lied to you and said that they keep people safe? I always like to take a cognitive behavioral therapy approach, step back and say, how did we even get here? How did we get to the point that you feel like you own these diseases and can spread them? And having somebody kind of unwind and separate themselves, like you said, diffusion, Alex, about from the OCD. And then once they feel ready to do that exposure, how can you engage in that soccer play and start to kind of trust your friends that they'll be able to handle themselves and that you're not this horrible person. And then I noticed that as that happens, they're like, I finally feel like I have some outlets. I'm not like at home. These are the healthy things I need in my life, the exercise and the relationship with my friends to, to, to kind of get through the trauma that I'm experiencing. So I think it's always just about how things are done. And I think that's why it's so important to find somebody that does the evidence-based treatment in a way that works for you. Cause there's going to be therapists that wouldn't do it 
it the way I do. They're going to have you deliberately get things dirty. They're going to have you cough on your hands and go to a kid's store and rub things. And for some people, that's absolutely effective. And for some people, it's not. So I think it's so important to kind of figure out the way the treatment can be done for you. Yeah, Chris, I really love that. Because if you take that client that you were just talking about, this hypothetical client, and let's say that they have you know a trauma of they just lost a parent to an illness. And then we are asking them to go and now just like, you know, be out and about and touch things that have germs all over them. How is that going to like, that's not, that's going to trigger things for them. Grief, it's going to trigger trauma, it's going to trigger loss. And so the way you are doing this, you can hear the difference between what a trauma informed exposure looks like versus something where we're just going to shove somebody into an exposure that could re-traumatize them in a way that is not going to be beneficial to their treatment when they have co-occurring PTSD and OCD. I think also therapy should be learning. I mean, what I learned from my treatment and from my trauma. And so um, for me, you know, I was abandoned by a parent at 13 after a violent incident. And so for me, like, like having a, a family member go on and like start a whole new family without me, like there was a lot of abandonment issues and things. And I'm not surprised that a lot of my core fears with OCD was around abandonment. And so for me, what I like about properly done treatment when I was doing CBT and ERP was the goal was not to just like accept being miserable is more so to learn. And it was like, oh, a lot of my fears come back to the same thing of being abandoned, being alone, being isolated. And so I'm doing all these compulsions to prevent myself from getting isolated. Meanwhile, I'm housebound and I'm isolated. So OCD is a self-fulfilling prophecy. So when I did the exposures, the way it was set up for me, you know, God bless Karen Pickett, who Allegra is friends with as well. No, um, she sure. was like, we're going to do these treatments because we got to get you back out there. We don't want you to be abandoned. And, and these exposures that you're doing, like reconnecting with friends, going to restaurants and stuff is to get you out of kind of that headspace. So I think it's important for clinicians specifically if a client has PTSD or trauma is like there has to be learning. There has to be a purpose and it has to all make sense. And I feel like then when I went and got trauma therapy, it was like the OCD, I kind of already uncovered some of those schemas and beliefs. So when then I went to a different therapist for it, it's like I'd already done some of that work and it wasn't such a disconnect. Yeah, you're gaining adaptive material for your life and that's important. Chris, yeah. Yeah. am I allowed to jump in here? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I just, I feel like we could seriously talk forever about this topic, but I just, I love what you said. And I feel like also there's an and there. I think that there's this other piece that sometimes um, OCD therapists miss. And that's that if you're going to work with a trauma client like yourself or like me, who I experienced physical, emotional, sexual abuse since the age of four. So I'm severely traumatized um and that's not funny but i have to laugh about it i mean we're crying so cheers to that my love I, Anytime I, I made a joke at the iscf conference and somebody was like you're so funny i'm like it all comes from trauma you're like <laughs> honey, I oh I was severely traumatized. so i think that if you're going to work you know, consciously make the decision to accept that client and work with them. It's not always all about the exposures. I think there's this emotional piece. When we trust someone with our worst fears, with our intrusive thoughts, with all these things, there is an attachment that's formed. And I think that might be hard for some folks who haven't worked with severely traumatized people. And there was a lot of also sort of CBT emotional work that went on with my OCD therapist, just learning how to have conflict, learning how to advocate for myself, learning how to argue with my therapist and then repair. There was a lot of that kind of basic life skills that went into it. And I think it's just so, so important to mention that because I think folks want to say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do trauma-informed OCD therapy, but they don't really understand what that entails. And so maybe you learn a little bit of prolonged exposure or you learn a little bit of trauma-informed care and you think that you can treat everyone with trauma. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. I think in my case, I had a good illustration of what it looks like to be ethical when my therapist said, hey, this is beyond my scope and you need to go somewhere else. Just like there's OCD specialists, there are also trauma specialists. Absolutely. And sometimes the best care is to refer out. Um, Brennan, I just put a, a YouTube link in the chat. There was a comment from 
Zachary Miller at 350. And he says, I'm starting ERP in one to two months. Why does it sound like psychological torture? Is it supposed to sound terrifying? Uh, Liz McInville, myself and John Hirschfield just did a really good live stream of like what updated ERP should look like. Please, Zach, watch it in the next one to two months. It's only an hour. But I think we really go into what ERP should look like. I agree. Like when I did my thesis and I read about the ERP trials in the early 1970s, I'm like, thank goodness I wasn't born because it did sound very kind of like harsh. But, you know, treatment all the time. Like I have I have a little kid client who's like excited to come into therapy. Like that's how it should be because people are learning and people are getting better. There is a comment, Legger, I'll find it, but I wanna ask you, um, somebody asked about alcohol. And I know with our community with OCD and our community with PTSD and trauma, a lot of people do tend to go to like alcohol and drugs. And so somebody was saying like, is that something if they have a problem with it, um, do they have to get treatment for that before? Can it be during? Like what is kind of the role in like, you know, harm reduction or sobriety and OCD and, and trauma treatment? I think this is where we fail a lot of people with OCD. I think that there are quite a few people who live with addiction and are struggling with OCD. And I think that the addiction can be a way to cope with OCD. But then a lot of the times it's work on the addiction first and then get treated for OCD, which I, I can see that being very valuable for sure. If someone's like living in addiction, it can be hard to do the OCD work. But I really think in the same way that we need trauma and OCD specialists and eating disorder and OCD specialists, I think we need addiction and OCD specialists. I think, I mean, look at Riley. I think that Riley was probably failed. Um, and I, I just think like I understand needing to treat addiction first, but I really wish that we had clinicians who could do both because those things don't live in a vacuum a lot of the time. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I think that the, the idea of like, hey, you can't get help until you sober up. I mean, well, I- It's demoralizing. Exactly. Like what I've done is I've worked with people before where it's like, it just, the treatment isn't gonna work. Like they show up high, mm -hmm. they right. can't even pay attention in session, et cetera. Um, and what I do is I'm like, look, like, let's find you somebody who specializes in that. Let's collaborate. Let, you know, I have support groups. Why don't you come to those? Like, you know, let's check in. Is it working, et cetera? Are there ways that you could be at least become sober for our sessions, even if you don't think you can after? So it should be something where it's like you don't abandon a client. It's not the like, well, sorry, I can't do anything for you. Like, too bad, so sad. And Riley, uh, Margaret Sisson's son, I, I feel it was that, you know, he was trying to get treatment and it was like, well, you have an alcohol issue, you have to figure it out on your own. Or a lot of times people go to a specialist, but the OCD is what's driving it. They're not specialists in OCD. So they keep drinking yeah. because the OCD is not getting treated and it has mm -hmm. to be something like that. Yeah. Uh, Ron, there was an experience with that. Yeah. Can you jump in on that before? Yeah. And sorry. Um, I just, I actually just finished up in San Francisco doing a panel with Dr. Patrick McGrath and Lauren Rosen and Stacy. And I think that it's so, so important that specialists not kick addicts out of treatment because as you just said, um, a lot of times it's the intrusive thoughts driving alcoholism and substance use. And when you kick people out of the thing that's actually gonna help them manage their condition, you're doing them a huge disservice. If my therapist had kicked me out, I wouldn't have been able to stop using. And yeah. I think okay. that's just, it's so, so important here, here's my dream. I, I met this guy. It was at the, uh, at the physical therapist after my car accident and he had OCD tattooed on his arm. And I remember just being like, oh my God, like you, I have OCD too. And I treat it and we were talking and I was like, what had you get it tattooed on your, your arm? And what he said to me is he said, you know, I went through so many rehabs and failed and they kept giving me anxiety treatment or depression treatment. And it wasn't until I realized that I had OCD, more of like the mental obsessions and compulsions, like I've always read it's physical, but it was all in my head. When I finally realized that OCD, that's the difference. And then I did get sober and I got better. And I've always thought Orange County, where I work and live, has the most uh, rehab centers and addiction centers per capita in the whole country. And I always am trying to do in services because I'm like, there's so many people I know that are here for OCD, but because it's more of the pure OCD, they're not getting the help that they, they need. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to throw a, a question um, at 353 to you, Bronwyn, from Zachary Miller. Is there any biological basis for developing OCD from trauma? 
Ooh, a biological basis, OCD from trauma. So we know that OCD onset can happen pre-PTSD, it can happen co-occurring with PTSD. Um, biological, I, I'm not, that would be a Caitlin Pinciotti question. <laughs> I would say that, um, you know, we know that OCD has a genetic component to it potentially from for a lot of people. And so we know that that is definitely something that can flow through. We also know that trauma, we can have intergenerational trauma. We can have people who have traumatized parents and then we're kind of growing up in those households. And then we also have trauma that is coming from those particular issues as well. Um, so we know that trauma can carry through in generations um, from one to the next. So, but if there is a biological thing, I think that question is probably still out there on exactly if like that's a more, you know, we're definitely going to develop. I always think that there is like, biological mechanisms at play, and then something happens in life that tips something forward. Um, but we probably need a lot more research on on that particular question. Yeah, well said. Um, before I give everybody a final moment, because we're freaking out the hour, which is crazy. I felt like we only talked for two minutes. Um, I really like Phil, and maybe you'll, you, Allegra and Alex, uh, Alex can comment real quick. I like Phil's comment at 358. He says, OCD is an extremely traumatic condition for many of us. Dealing with intrusive thoughts can feel like being in shock at times at what the mind is doing. Like, do we amen that or what? Because like, <laughs> <Yeah, like, laughs> put it on a t-shirt, Phil, you get 10%. <laughs> No, when my clients are like, but I have this thought, I'm like, you literally have no idea what my brain is capable of, babe. Like, we're good. Whatever you say, I've thought it. So it's fine. Yeah. Can you relate to that, Alex, that comment from Phil? I can. I can relate to it. And then there's a part of me, honestly, that gets really sad because sometimes I'm like, man, sometimes I get jealous of people. Honestly, I know this is not cute to say, right. But I get jealous of people because I have so many things going on personally that sometimes folks say that. And like, I relate on the one hand, I'm like, yes, OCD is awful. It can be very traumatic, but also I wish I only had OCD. And I know that's not cute, but it's real. And I want to own it because I know that there are other people like me out there who like, we see ourselves reflected in everything. And then we also have all this other stuff. And so I'm going to, I'm going to be ugly and say that it's okay sometimes to feel that jealousy, but we can also validate everyone else because OCD does fucking suck. Well, I think owning it's great. Ethan and I were talking about it once. Like, you know, when, when we see it for me, when I see a client coming into treatment at six and they're like, the mom's like, he just started showing symptoms two weeks ago and I got him in and I'm like, Yes. And where the hell, like, that was not my experience. So I'm jealous. So, um, all right. So this is definitely going to be one of those that needs a part two, because uh, it, it's like, I always know there needs to be a part two where I'm like, we could go another hour. Um, but before we log out of trauma and OC, I'm going to give each of the panelists a final thoughts. So I'm going to go in the, the circle that you're on in my screen. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Bronwyn. What are some final thoughts on this topic and things you could leave people with that can leave them with some some resources, education, hope, whatever you'd like to share? Yeah, just just know that there are people out there that can help you with these things and um, always be a good advocate for yourself. If something doesn't feel right to you in therapy and your therapist isn't addressing your needs the way you feel like needs to be getting done, then get help from somebody else. I saw a question um, about trying to afford all of this. Like if we're talking about having to see a PTSD specialist and an OCD specialist, how do, how do you do that? And unfortunately, there's a lot of people in, um, within mental health now that aren't accepting insurance and that can make it difficult and cost and costly. But there are a lot of therapists who will do sliding fee scales and will work with you or even take pro bono cases. So make sure you keep reaching out to people and don't lose hope around that. Well said. Alex, we'll have you go next. I think my my biggest thought here is just that you're not too broken. I think a lot of times when we have trauma and OCD, we we have so much guilt and shame and we take so much responsibility for everything that's happened to us that we feel very broken. And going through the merry-go-round of finding clinicians who do understand and help can be traumatizing in and of itself. And it can also lend to that feeling of brokenness of I'm not, I'm too bad off to get better. If I can get better, I believe that anyone, as long as they have the resources and the accessibility can get better. You're not too broken. 
It's definitely a mic drop moment. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> and Allegra. Yeah, I would just say if you're experiencing CD that you absolutely deserve to work on. Oh my God, Bronwyn, your cat is so cute. So that I you absolutely it. deserve to work on that. And if your clinician says OCD can't be traumatic, maybe find somebody else who's able to validate you because I, I really wholeheartedly believe that OCD can be traumatic. Yeah. And for my, my final thought, I know Michelle just jumped on at 304. She even asked like, what about a younger sibling who experienced trauma growing up watching older siblings with OCD boss around the family? Like there's some really great stuff that unstuck. It's a movie by Chris Bear. Um, they do a lot of stuff on like how it affects the siblings. I know at the conferences, there's usually a sibling talk. Um, so Michelle, it's definitely something where they've addressed that, that family members and siblings can go through this whole experience and be impacted just as much as the person with OCD because they feel stuck and sometimes feel like they have a smaller voice. There's definitely resources on that. My final thought is I think one of the best things I did for my recovery is get trauma therapy after my OCD therapy, because I think that it really kind of healed me. And the OCD would play on my fear of abandonment, it would play on my fear of danger, of not being safe. And when I healed that, OCD didn't have as much to much fodder to work with. So I think if you're someone that has gotten excellent OCD care, but maybe didn't deal with some of the stuff we talked about today, or like we heard on the panel, like what Allegra was just saying, or what Alex was saying, if it wasn't working the way it should work, or you don't feel validated and heard, please find someone. Um, there's a directory at iocf.org slash find dash help. For the people that came in late, some people were like, oh, this sounds great, but I missed the first part. These are all recorded and you could either go under um, live videos on YouTube at the IOCS YouTube or their Facebook and watch the full thing. And please share it with anyone you think would really, really find um, it helpful. I wanna thank my panelists. We had three excellent, strong, powerful women on the panel today. It was such an honor to hear from them. We'll definitely uh, work out a part two and make sure that you go to iocdf.org slash OCD week. It is OCD awareness week and there's so many activities uh, that are happening for the rest of the week until Saturday. So make sure to check it there. But thanks so much to my panelists. Have a great rest of your day. And like Alex said, you absolutely are not broken. You can get help. I love that. So and look at Bronwyn's cat when you're sad. That's the other. <laughs> it wouldn't be a, anything with, with me without a cat showing up. There's many of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you to so everyone for joining us.